They call upon uh, praying for presenting ideal transplant recipient with meningitis. Uh, good afternoon to all. I am Dr. Prem Kumar and I am going to present a case of meningitis in a renal transplant recipient. Moving on to the history, uh, he is Mr. X, 24 years old gentleman who is a live related renal transplant recipient done elsewhere, presented to us with the history of headache for past one month and history of fever and on and off for past two weeks. A uh, brief history of uh, pre-transplant events. In 2014, he presented with uremic symptoms and he was initiated on hemodialysis. He had a dialysis vintage of 5 months and in 2015 he underwent ABO compatible live related renal transplant with maternal grandmother as a donor. He had immediate graft function and he was discharged with triple immunosuppression regimen. Uh, post transplant events, uh, in, at one month post transplant he had a zoster infection and he was managed with oral antivirals. At one year three months he presented with acute graft dysfunction. He also had a history of uh, poor drug complaints at that time. And allograft biopsy showed ACR 1A and he was uh, given anti rejection therapy. Uh, five years post transplant, he had a, he presented the history of fever with cough with expectoration. On evaluation, he was found to be sputum positive pulmonary tuberculosis and he received nine months of anti tuberculosis therapy. In six years post transplant, he presented with acute gastroenteritis and acute, acute or chronic graft dysfunction. And seven years post transplant, that is two months prior to current admission. He presented with the history of fever, headache, vomiting and slurring of speech and on evaluation he is found to have cerebral loss signs that is uh, dysdiagokinesia, nystagmus and incoordination are present. On imaging there was only hyperintense lesion in the left parietal lobe. So he proceeded with the CSF analysis. CSF analysis were normal at that time. He was empirically treated with antiviral therapy and his symptoms improved and he was discharged in a stable condition. Moving on to the current admission. Uh, he presented the history of headache which is uh, incidence in the onset and progressive, severe in nature, holoprenial and associated with vomiting and blurring of vision for past one month and he also had a history of fever which is low grade and it is present for past 15 days. And in, on neurological examination, he does not have any focal neurological deficit other than this tachycosti CNS infection. Fundus examination was normal, hence we proceeded with the neuroimaging. And imaging showed a hyperintensity lesion in the lentiform, left lentiform nucleus. We proceeded with the CSF analysis. It showed a high protein, 295 milligram per deciliter and low glucose of 25 milligram per deciliter. Cells, 25 cells, all were lymphocytes. And in view of a past pulmonary tuberculosis, we have started him on empirical ATT. Two days later, he developed a generalized tonic-clonic seizure and he was shifted to intensive renal care unit. At the time, we had a differentials of uh, progressive CNS infection or dyselectrolytelemia or drug induced seizure. In view of uh, multiple episodes of seizure, we have uh, repeated imaging. This time, the imaging showed uh, multiple hyperintensities in the uh, uh, left frontal region and the uh, genome of the corpus callosum and bilateral cerebellar hemispheres. Hence, we repeated the uh, CSF analysis. Second CSF analysis showed Cells of 30 all are lymphocytes, again high protein of 276 mg per deciliter and glucose, low glucose of 30 mg per deciliter. At this time CBNAC became negative and we have uh, done India stain to rule out cryptococcus which is uh, it showed encapsulated yeast and the cryptococcal antigen in the CSF is also detected. Hence a diagnosis of cryptococcal meningoencephalitis has been made. And he was treated with uh, First induction phase, he was treated with injection liposomal amphotericin B at a dose of 3 mg per kg per day plus tablet flu cytosin at a dose of 100 mg per kg per day in 3 divided doses for 2 weeks. After 2 weeks, uh, he was moved to the consolidation phase where we have given high dose fluconazole of 400 mg per day with the close monitoring of the tacrolimus trough levels. Uh, during his course of hospitalization, he received intensive care unit care and anti-epileptics in the form of IV, levetiracetam and sodium valproate and he also received antifungals in the induction phase of liposomal amphotericin B and then in the consolidation phase, tablet fluconazole, high dose fluconazole. Tracolomus trough level has been monitored as fluconazole interface with the CNI metabolism. We have monitored the tacrolimus level. In our unit protocol, whenever we are going to start on azoles, we will come down the CNA level by 40% before starting and then we will decide on the dose by tacrolimus trough levels. 
the patient has been discharged in a stable condition after 45 days of admission. We went to the brief discussion of uh, CNS infection. Whenever you come across a CNS infection, in particular in an immunocompromised patient, first imaging has to be done, either CT with or without contrast. When you have a MOS lesion, you have to see any evidence of herniation. If there is an evidence of herniation, you can consult a neurosurgeon. And the with MOS lesion with no evidence of herniation, CSF profile gives a major clue for diagnosis. In CSF, you have to look for the opening pressure and WBCs with the differential counts and bacteria culture. In special situations, uh, to rule out TB, you have to rule out uh, acid phosphate and mycobacterial culture. In fungal culture and cryptococcal antigen in special situations. And also we can do viral PCR. This is the CSF profile in patients with meningitis. In bacterial meningitis, the appearance will be turbid. Uh, there will be elevated opening pressure and WBC's count will be high. And the proteins will be high in the range of more than 200 and, uh, and the glucose will be very low. And in viral meningitis, the appearance will be clear and uh, the opening pressure will be normal. Uh, the counts will not be as high as in case of bacterial meningitis. It will be lymphocyte predominant and the proteins will be less than 200 and glucose will be normal in uh, viral meningitis. In fungal meningitis, the appearance will be clear. The opening pressure can be normal or elevated and WBC counts will be high. It will be more, usually less than 500 and uh, proteins will be more than 200 and glucose here also will be normal to low. And moving on to the uh, various presentations in the post transplant recipients, CNS, CNS infection can present as meningitis or encephalitis or focal brain lesions. Whenever you come across a meningitis as a routine, you have to rule out uh, uh, bacterial and uh, tubercular lesions. And in transplant region, fungal lesions are more common. We have to rule out cryptococcus, aspergillus, and candida. To rule out cryptococcus, we have to do cryptococcal antigen either in a serum or CSF and India egg staining. Aspergillus, galactomannan and beta D glucan can be done. In candida, if the presence of pseudo hyphae with the budding yeast, it can be ruled out. Whenever you come across encephalitis, it is mostly of viral origin and it is uh, diagnosed based on the imaging or on the viral PCR. Focal brain lesions can be caused by toxoplasmosis or fungus like mucor, aspergillus and candida. Moving on to the cryptococcus. Cryptococcus is a basidomycetes yeast. More than 30 known species have been identified. But majority of human infections are caused by Cryptococcus neoformans and Cryptococcus gatti. And uh, Cryptococcus neoformans is a spherical yeast which is surrounded by the polysaccharide capsule. This polysaccharide capsule is the main virulence factor. It can be cultured in the laboratories. It uh, classically produces dark brown colonies in the bird seed agar. We have the Cryptococcal meningitis. It usually present as subacute meningitis and uh, it, the symptoms will be very subtle in the form of fever or headache. And it rarely present as obvious meningitis with the typical meningeal signs. And this cryptococcus neoformans is an encapsulated with the surrounding polysaccharide capsule which is the main virulence factor. Uh, in healthy patients, uh, they the transmission of the cryptococcus is mainly by the aerosol spread. Once it is inhaled, uh, this, uh, it is encountered by the alveolar macrophages. And this alveolar macrophages invites the dendritic cells. And this dendritic cells present these cryptococcal antigens to the T cells. Once this is presented, this T cells get activated and it releases uh, various cytokines which uh, act, it activates the classical M1 macrophages which is the fungicidal in this. It, uh, this uh, uh, classical M1 macrophages releases various cytokines like interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 8 and TNF alpha. In this cytokine milieu, these can uh, uh, eradicate this cryptococcal antigen by forming a granuloma. Uh, the route of uh, CNS uh, uh, transmission for the cryptococcus, uh, there are three main routes of transmission. Once it is inhaled into the lungs, either it can damage the blood brain barrier directly or it, there can be a hematogenous spread or macrophages can act as a Trojan horse. That is, uh, these macrophages can carry these spores into the CNS circulation and cause CNS disease. Diagnosis of the cryptococcal meningitis is mainly by the CSF analysis. As we have already seen, the symptoms and signs will be very subtle. So it is mainly based on the CSF analysis and this India Inc, it has only 50% sensitivity, sensitivity and it needs expertise but it is 100% specific. And uh, there is another test called serum cryptococcal antigen which is a very useful screening test and uh, one is to eight, more than 1 to 8 titer is uh, considered as a positive. And this uh, CSF, uh, cryptococcal antigen can be done even in the CSF uh, and uh, there, uh, cryptococcus can also be diagnosed by blood and urine culture. We have the traditional methods versus the antigen deduction. As we seen that India ink staining is only 50% sensitive and it needs expertise. 
and this culture also requires days for the final reports. Whether antigen detection is very sensitive and specific and it can be, it can give the results very quickly. And this uh, new dipstick test is used to detect the cryptococcal antigen. It is very simple and quick and it is very accurate, more than 95% uh, sensitivity and accuracy. And it detects the cryptococcal antigen in serum, urine and also in the CSF fluids. Uh, one thing is, in this uh, cryptococcal antigen can be detected uh, 24, 22 days before the onset of uh, symptoms of meningitis in a serum. So, even in a window period, we can detect the patients before they are going for, going for the full-blown meningitis. We have the treatment. It involves uh, three phases. First is the infection phase. In infection phase, liposomal amphotericin B, it is given at a dose of 3 to 4 mg per kg per day, plus tablet flucytosin at a dose of 100 mg per kg per day, in three divided doses for two weeks. This is followed by the consolidation phase. In this high dose fluconazole at a dose of 400 to 800 mg per day is given for eight weeks. Moving into the maintenance phase, in this low dose fluconazole at a dose of 200 to 400 mg is given for six months to one year. Uh, it is a French cohort retrospective study. Uh, this study was uh, done to describe the epidemiology presentation and outcome of uh, outcome in the patients with meningitis or meningoencephalitis in the solid organ transplant recipients. In this, uh, 199 cases has been studied. In that, they have found that uh, one fourth were caused by the fungal. And in this, 21% uh, is caused by the cryptococcus neoformans. We have the rare case reports of cryptococcus. This cryptococcus meningitis can even present as a bilateral complete ophthalmoplegia. And it can also present as uh, deafness and blindness. And this cryptococcal meningitis can also present as deafness and blindness in the patients with renal transplant recipient. And uh, this cryptococcus has also been known to cause cellulitis uh, in the rare uh, clinical scenarios in the renal transplant patients. Currently, the patient is on our follow up and he is doing well. Uh, he does not have any further episodes of seizure or headache. We have been closely mon monitoring him with the TACRO levels and we are mon optimizing the TACRO, TACRO MS dose. Thank you. Cryptococcal infection, we don't come across that frequently. There are certain instances where we have looked for it, but we haven't picked it up. Uh, so I, saw, I, I came across one cryptococcal in the IT's when I was a trainee in the process. Subsequently, I don't remember to have come across. Steroid, probably steroid is uh, <coughs> more uh, risk factor, higher risk factor than C, probably. Quite true. Probably. After that, quite some time we haven't come across. After it is going well, actually the thing is that uh, the treatment is very aggressive. <laughs> For quite some time, look on its own, it is not such an easy drug, drug interaction. So none of these infections, I think, they can get eradicated in the transplant recipients. So, we war against these bugs continues. <laughs>